Hello there, everyone. This is Eric Sullivan, back for more Python. Today, we're going to do probably one of the most important parts of learning how to program, and that's doing repetitive tasks really efficiently on a computer. The tool that we're going to do, or the tool that we're going to learn, I'm sorry, is called a loop. A loop is specifically designed to do a repetitive task over and over and over again quickly on a computer. We're also going to do something about conditional statements, but I think that'll be video number two. So we're looking for for loops, conditional statements, if statements, and while loops. It's going to be a three video sequence. So let's first think about repetitive tasks in, in, in Python. So say we want to print the squares of all the numbers, one, two, three, four, all the way up to 10. How would you do it? Well, we could do print one squared, print two squared, print three squared. I'm already bored. Well, okay, fine. Maybe I'll copy and paste. Change that to a five. Change that to a six. Okay, I'm really bored with doing this, but fine, we can do it. I, I didn't even get done because I was already bored. All right, that's just a horrible way to do this. A computer is designed to do computation and it's designed to do repetitive tasks really, really simply. So let's add another code block here. And I'm going to introduce you to what's called the for loop. The for loop is named actually for the command that you give to the programming language. And it's actually pretty common to every, excuse me, to every programming language. The syntax, in other words, the way you type it into the computer is different between languages. But the Python one's relatively simple. So here's what we do. We start with the word for. Then we give it a number, or I'm sorry, I'm not a number. We give it a letter, so for n, and it's just going to be my counter in this case, in, literally the word in. And now I'm going to give it a list of things. So I'm going to go range 1, 11, 1. And then a colon and enter. Now pause. What does range 1, 11, 1 do? Now I'm going to show you a neat little trick in Google Colab. There's this thing called a scratch code cell, which I'm going to open here. So I went to insert scratch code cell, move my picture out of the way. This allows you to run code outside of your regular program. Okay, so this gives me a range object. That's fine. Make a list. Okay, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So a scratch cell allows you to do a little bit of scratch work off to the side and then throw it away. So for n, n is a counter in this list, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So n is going to be in that list. What I'm going to do is I'm going to print n to the second. OK, and go. 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36. There they are. Beautiful. And now if I wanted the first 100 of them, let's just make the range go from 1 to 101. Imagine trying to do that with this command. That would be horrific. In fact, notice that the command that I did here that was the repetitive thing is exactly the command that I have here inside the loop except I'm sending n, the thing that's being counted through the loop, into this command. Well, let's make it even more simple. Instead of doing the squares, let's just do the numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, yeah, here we go. OK, all the way down to, and I scroll, 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 down to 100. A for loop is designed to do repetitive tasks really simply. OK, now there's a compact way in Python to write a for loop. OK, I'll call it the compact list. So I'm going to generate a list. So I'm going to do n to the second 
for n in range 1 comma 11 comma 1. Now there is quite a lot going on in this little line of code. n squared is what we wanted to generate for n in this list, which is a list of numbers from 1 to 10. And there they are. There's my perfect squares. Now, personally, I don't use this style of for loops very often because I find that it's just a smidge harder to read than, scrolling back, this. I find that the extra line break and a little bit of breakup in the syntax is easier to read. Okay, so let's just do a handful of examples here. Okay, for examples of why you might want to use for loops in the first place. So here in example one, I have a sequence, xn plus one. So the new x is negative one half xn plus one with the initial condition starting at three. I want the first 10 terms, or let's say the first 100, or the first 1,000, or first 5 million, or whatever. Okay, so I'm gonna start us off with x is equal to three. And then what I'm gonna do is for n in range, now it says I want the first 10 terms, so what if I did range 11? Remember the range command, I can just tell it where to stop. It's exclusive on the stop. So if I did 11, it's gonna go up to number 10. And I can say x equals negative 0 0.5 times x plus one. Now this just generates the new term, and why don't I print x? And I'll print the first one here too. Okay, now I need you to put me on pause and let's and think about what this is gonna do. And if you're not sure, well then keep watching for a second. All right, control enter. Okay, here we go. X equals three got printed. Then I took negative a half times three and added one. Well, it's negative a half times three, so see half of three is 1.5, right? So that's negative 1.5, added one to it, so I got negative 0.5, there it is. Then I printed it. Now I went to the very next term in the sequence, and I said, okay, I'm gonna take what's stored in my x and multiply it by negative a half and add one. Well, let's make this a little bit more clear. Oops, no, I actually want that there. So I've got n equals, I'm gonna say n, x equals, and then I'm gonna say x. This print command is hopefully gonna make things a little bit more clear for me. There we go, that's what I wanted. And now it's going to be consistent. So for n equals 0, I had x equals 3. For n equals 1, I've got x equals negative 0.5. For n equals 2, x equals 1.25, and so on. Now I can make this go much further if I wanted to. I don't really want to scroll that far. But it'll do it, and it does it very quickly. And ooh, this uh, sequence seems to have a stable equilibrium, or seems to have an equilibrium. Look at that. That's pretty cool. Okay. So that's one way to generate this sequence. Let's generate this sequence in a different way. So scroll, scroll, scroll. Here's one more piece of code. I'm gonna say x is a list of zero, a list that just contains zero times 10. Now that's, that's a little bit weird. So already, what the heck did I just do? Print x. Oh, that's super cool. It's a list. Now just repeat that list 10 times. That's really slick. Okay, I wanted my initial condition to be three. Okay, so I'm gonna put a three in the initial spot. And then I'm gonna say four n in range one comma 11 x of n, ooh, wait a minute. I wanna go from zero. x of n plus one equals x of n 
if I remember the sequence, negative 0.5 times xn plus 1. Okay, now let's stop and think about what this sequence, or what this for loop is going to do. We know what that line does. Okay, it gave me a list of all zeros with 10 entries. This one fills in the first entry with a 3. Now this one's going to start counting from n equals 0 and stop at n equals 10. And it's going to say, give me, in the very next entry, I'm going to take negative 0.5 times the previous entry plus 1. OK, now let's see what it did. I had, well, I didn't print off the list initially. I should probably do that, print x. There we go. So there's my initial list with the three filled in, then I filled in the next one, then I filled in the next one, then I filled in the next one, then the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And I keep going down and uh-oh, I got an error. List assignment index out of range. Well, I tried to go up to the 10th one. There are 10 here, but this says fill in the 11th one. I'm still out of range. Oh, OK. Oh, I, OK. Sorry. Put me on pause, go back and see why I was a little bit confused there. I was going one too far. Right? The point of the matter here, though, is that I, was, I, I made the list, I filled in the first entry of the list, and then I filled in every subsequent entry of the list as I went. Now, it's a little bit of a bad idea to actually print that within the loop. So if I back out of the indent, the loop is over. And now that won't execute each time. All it did was print this one. It ran the whole loop and then printed this one. So this is a, a, a case of wanting to do a repetitive task many, many times and then print out the answer. Now one more, and I'm starting to run a little bit long here, but that's okay. We're going to get the, the sum of the first 100 perfect cubes. So let's do that, right? I'm going to do that in one particular way here. So I want the first 100 cubes. So I'm going to say n is 100 numbers, right? And I'm going to say my x is, I'm going to say it's a 0 that's 100 entries long, the first 100 perfect cubes. Excuse me. Oops. And now. For n in, let's see, what should I do? Let's stop and think about this for a second. I want the first 100 perfect cubes. So I'm going to take, I'm going to go from 1 up to the number of cubes that I wanted, plus 1. And then I'm going to in that entry, x of n, put n itself. And then in the end, well, OK, before I even show you what, I, what it does in the end, ooh, it didn't like that. Ooh, out of range again. Keep making the same mistake. OK, so it ran it. That's all well and good. OK. Now I wanted cubes, so I'm going to raise those to the third power. So now I've got 0, 1, 8, 27, 64, blah, 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 blah. OK. What if I just blindly try to take a sum? And there it is. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. OK. Now I did a lot in this very last for loop. So put me on pause and go do it yourself. Go check out how you would do this. See you in the next video.